Yo, Adam Saxon with Guy in the Cube, and in this video, we are going to look at my sweet mistress, Kerberos, with the gateway using single sign on. Let's do it. If you're finding us for the first time, be sure to hit that subscribe button to stay up to date with all the videos from both Patrick and myself. All right, the gateway, single sign on, Kerberos, what the heck? Why do we even care about this? Well, to illustrate this, what I want to look at is the gateway going uh, to a SQL server. And by default, when I implement a data source in the gateway using Windows authentication, I have to hard code that username and password. In this example, we'll say that I set up that data source using ASAX and a guy in a cube. That means any traffic going through that gateway is going to use my ASAX and credential hitting the data source. I don't necessarily want that from a, from a database perspective. I want the actual user that's signing into Power BI to actually flow through to the database. But in this scenario, if I sign in with John Doe, ASAXON is still hitting the database itself from the gateway perspective. So ideally, John Doe signs into Power BI and then John Doe hits the actual database itself. And if we're looking at a large organization of 5,000 users, I don't want to have to hand code those username and passwords either. So that's really what we're talking about here. A couple things to call out right in the beginning. There is a limited number of data sources you can use with single sign on. In this case, I'm using SQL Server that does support SQL sign on. So that'll be good for this example. Another thing, there are some things we're going to look at here in this video that in order to create them, you may need domain admin rights in your organization. So you may have to work with your IT organization to actually get some of these items in place in order for this to be successful. All right, enough of all this talking, let's head over to my computer and see what this looks like. All right, so we've got, I'm signed in as my ASAXON account. And what we'll do here real quick is we'll go look at manage gateways. And we'll look and see that I do have a data source created for SQL Windows Auth. And this is my hard coded credential. So I've got gynecube slash asaxon for the username and then my password. So I'm the one that's going to be hitting the SQL database. To illustrate that, let's go over to my John Doe account. Let's go and refresh this. And I've got Azure Data Studio up. And what we will see is that the logged in user here is Gynecube A Saxon because that's the hard coded credential. This is what we're going to fix. There are three things that we're going to look at. The first is service principal name or SPN. The second is going to be constrained delegation. And the third is going to be local policy settings. All three of those sound really scary, but I'm going to walk you through it. All right, to start this journey, let's head over to the machine running the gateway. And what I want to look at is service settings, the actual gateway service account. In this case, the gateway is running gynecube slash gateway SVC. So that means it's running an actual domain user account instead of the default account, which is a local Windows service account. This is really important because when we talk about service principal names or the SPNs and also the constraint delegation, it's dependent on what this account is because that's going to tell us where to go to do these actions. So now we know that the gateway is running gateway SVC. I'll also tell you that the SQL server is running under a Windows user account as well called SQL service. So now what we're going to do, let's open up PowerShell here. First thing we're going to do is we're going to go list the SPNs that are on the gateway service account. To do that, we're going to use a tool called set SPN. And the dash L means we're going to list out what those SPNs are on the given Windows account that's there. You'll notice I don't have the domain in front of it. If I'm just in a single domain, this is fine. If, if you're doing cross domain type activities, then you may want to specify the actual domain in front of this. But I'll also tell you if you're doing cross domain activities, this gets a little more complicated. So just be aware of that as well. Let's go and run this and we'll see Power BI slash gateway. Now, Power BI slash gateway itself is not an actual valid SPN. It's not an SPN for anything. And we'll come back to this in terms of why I have it here. But effectively, this is a fake SPN, but it's required for the constraint delegation piece. So we will circle back on that. You do need to have an SPN on the service count for the gateway itself. Let's say that I just left it as the NT service account. If you leave it at the, as the NT service account for the gateway itself, then you're in the context of the machine. 
And if we just run set SPN on the machine account itself, so the machine name is Guy in a Cube SQL, you'll see that it's already got a bunch of SPNs there. So you don't need to do anything for that. So you kind of get that for free. We need at least one service principal name for what we're going to look at in constrained delegation. All right, cool. So that's the gateway service account. So we're good there. Check. We need at least one service principal name or SPN listed on the gateway service account. We have that. So now let's look at the SQL service account. So the data source has to have an SPN as well. And I specify, I told you before that the service count SQL's running is SQL service. So we're going to list those out. And the SQL service count has SPNs as well. And these are valid SPNs. So that is great. So these are working. Now, if you did need to add an SPN, you can use the set SPN command. There's dash A or dash S. I recommend dash S. Just know that adding a service principal name requires domain administrator rights. Doing a dash L or listing generally does not require domain administrator rights. You'll get an error if it if it does. Okay, so that's the first step. Our SPNs are in place on both the data source and the gateway itself. That's a critical step, right? Those have to be there. And you have to make sure they're in the right location and they're not being duplicated. Because a duplication means they're going to cancel each other out and it's as the same effect as if you had none. That's why knowing the service accounts that are running the gateway and the SQL server are super important because that's the location of where those SPNs need to go. You with me? All right, let's keep going. All right, next is gonna be constrained delegation. This piece is gonna require domain administrator rights. And so for doing this, uh, going back, remember our gateway is running under gynacube slash gateway SVC. So we're gonna head over to my domain controller. This doesn't have to be done on the domain controller, but that's where I've got Active Directory users and computers. And I'm going to look for my gateway service account. I'm going to double click on it. And you're going to see this delegation tab as part of the account. The delegation tab, this is the reason why we needed to add that fake SPN on the gateway SVC account, because the delegation tab will not show up unless at least one SPN is present. We do have at least one SPN. We added that fake SPN so we can get the delegation tab. And in here, you need to select trust this user for delegation for specified services only. And then the sub radio dial you need to select is use any authentication protocol. This is called protocol transitioning. And this is needed because we're going from the Power BI user, which is actually just your email address, and that's getting passed to the gateway. And the gateway is converting that into a Kerberos token. Now, in order to do that, it's got to transition from that email address to the Kerberos token. Therefore, protocol transitioning. And then under there, we need to specify the actual services that the gateway service can delegate the authentication to. In this case, it's just SQL server. So if you were going to two different SQL servers, they would have to be listed here. If you're going to a SQL server and maybe an analysis services, they would have to be listed here, right? So just from a pure delegation perspective, anything you're delegating to, whatever's downstream has to be listed here. All right, so our delegation settings are right. So what's going on? I mentioned there was one more piece here that we got to look at before we go to that. Let's go over to let's just illustrate that the service principal name and the and the delegation settings. So the constrained delegation settings are not the only things that we need to do here. One thing I want to show you here, we're going to look at the advanced settings and underneath here, there's two check boxes that we're going to see. I could go ahead and check use SSO for Kerber via Kerberos for direct query queries. However, that doesn't get me the ability to do import refresh. Uh, if I was just doing direct query, this option is perfectly fine. But I want to take advantage of this also from not only direct query, but also if I'm importing or refreshing the data. You'll notice here that I cannot check the use SSO via Kerberos for direct query or import queries. This is because this selection has to be made up front when you create the data source. So in this case, we're going to delete this data source and recreate it so we can check that box. All right, let's add data source. All right, so I've got Windows credentials selected. I'm not going to enter in a username and password. And when I select advanced, you know, it's saying I've got to fill it out. Just ignore that. I'm going to check this box. The minute I do that, the username and password get grayed out, right? I don't, I don't have that option anymore. And I don't need to put in a username and password here. But Adam, that's bananas. Like, well, how is this going to work? Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and hit add. Hang in there with me. This is created successfully. We're going to go to the users tab and make sure John Doe can use it because he is the owner of the data set. All right. So now this is selected. 
Next, we're going to go over to John Doe's account here, and we're going to, we need to reconfigure the data source for the gateway. So we'll go into gateway connection and we will change this to Windows auth. You'll notice SSO is now uh, in parentheses there. And then we're going to hit apply, go back to the data set to make sure that our thing is cleared here so we can see it. And then let's go ahead and refresh. And we got an error, which I expect. So this error itself, if we go into refresh history, we're going to see that it gives us an impersonation error because of the fact that I said that there's three steps and we've only done two of them so far. So the third one obviously is going to be the winner. So to continue this journey, let's jump over to the gate, the machine running the gateway itself, and we'll go to local policies. And under local security policies, we're going to go to local policy, user rights assignments, and inside of user right assignments, there's two items that we need to add the gateway service account to. Some folks will tell you, oh, you just need to add the service account to the local admin group. You, one of these you will get for free if you do that, but the one that we need first, this act as part of the operating system doesn't have anything listed. So we have to add the gateway service account to this item. Uh, adding it to the local administrators group won't get this working. So let's go ahead and add it. The other one that we want to add is impersonate a client after authentication. You'll notice the administrator, local administrators group is listed here. So you would get this one for free, but I don't recommend adding the gateway service account to the local admin group. It's just not a good security practice. So let's go ahead and add the gateway SVC here as well. So typically whenever I get a failure, I want to go ahead and restart the gateway. So let's go ahead and restart that now. It just clears out any caching that might be happening. Or as I like to say, when in doubt, reboot. So now let's go ahead and clear out our Azure Data Studio. Let's go back to John Doe, back to the data set and go ahead and refresh. And bam, no errors. Let's go over to Azure Data Studio. And now we can see Gynecube slash John Doe, even though we did not enter any username and password, it is passing through from a single sign-on perspective. Kerberos, it just works. All right, I know that was a lot of information. This is a confusing topic, I get it. Let me know down in the comments below if you wanna see more stuff about Kerberos, or if you have any questions about what I showed you, you know where to do it, down below. If you like this video, be sure to hit that big thumbs up button, smash it if you so desire. If it's your first time here, hit that subscribe button. And as always, from both Patrick and myself, thank you so much for watching. Keep being awesome, and we'll see you in the next video.